My question is about heel work. No matter what I do, she's always a solid step ahead of me. I pull her back. I try walking slower or changing directions. Even after getting her back in position, after three steps, she's ahead again. Feels like I'm constantly correcting and pulling back. So you're turning into this little game of bounce back, bounce back, bounce back, bounce back, bounce back, bounce back, and none of it is changing the behavior because you just said you're constantly correcting. So you're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. What does that feel like to the dog? It feels normal. All you're doing is increasing the dog's ability to take pressure from you, and it's all it's gonna do is require you to put more pressure on to get change. They're so used to it and calloused that it doesn't even affect them. You are gonna have to make a solid correction to start out with, and then each one from there should become less and less and less until I'm not even putting a leash on the dog anymore. That is the goal. All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, another podcast episode. We have been on a little bit of a hiatus, a bit of a break. Ben was, uh, where were you? Utah. Utah, um, doing a little fly fishing. So uh, when Ben's away, nothing gets done around here. That's evident and clear. So he's back, and we're gonna we're gonna start to get back into the groove of recording, probably a couple times a week. Um, I thought we did a pretty nice job of doing that up until your little vacation there. So. Um, and, and, it's, and it's easier actually, it sounds funny, but it's easier for us, it's easier for me um, to do these podcasts consistently the more consistently we do them. It sounds weird, but it's just, if you only, we used to do once a week, and, and if you do once a week, it's really easy to miss that once a week, um, and then all of a sudden it becomes once every other week. And so as we've increased the number and the frequency of doing them, I think they've become just a lot easier on our end. So. And I will say this, uh, it's a thank you to you guys for listening to them because I probably, I have gotten um, just a tremendous amount of support and feedback from you with, hey, I listen to the podcast, I really appreciate your willingness to do that. I, I don't think about it that way, but when I do get a message like that, I go, oh, there's a reason, there's another reason, there's a reason why we do it. So um, I thank you. We are really grateful for having tremendous following. Um, the, the, our, I always tell people our numbers aren't real big, um, so our, our coverage is not wide, but it's real deep. And the people that, that listen to our stuff and the people that follow along with us um, are, are real passionate, and that, that's something that keeps, keeps me energetic, keeps pushing me as well. Um, so a quick follow-up. I did, I did, we did a podcast. Uh, we probably recorded it two weeks ago, the one that we did when we were on our way to Buffalo County, um, about the gal with the little lab that was creating a lot of issues. She messaged back to me, um, and so we, I am waiting to get some videos from them. Uh, we, are gonna, we are gonna try our best to help out their family. Um, I, I can't remember exactly what, what Sarah. Um, could Sarah Jamal, yep. So I messaged her back. I said, hey, I'm gonna wait um, and get some get this list of priorities. And so we're working on that. So that's something that's going. Uh, today's, this morning, or it's this afternoon, I guess, uh, almost this evening. It's funny how the day goes by, but uh, got a message, yes, I got it yesterday. Um, and I wanted to touch on it because this is a question I've had now for, uh, I don't know, I've gotten it two or three times in the last couple weeks. Plus, I've got a friend that's working with a young pup. Um, I'm helping him out every week they come. We start, just started doing heel work with the puppy. The puppy's about 13 weeks old. Uh, started, started working with him, been working on him in the evenings on Thursday nights, it seems, is the, the routine that we've got set up. But, um, I just ran into it with them. And so we're gonna talk about that a little bit, but this was a message that I got. It said, hey, I have a question for you if you have time to answer. Um, oh, actually, this, is a, this was an old message that they, ans that they asked me. Um, no, here it is. So got a question for you. Female Vizsla, 14 months old, have had a lot of success on place training and retrieving. Gonna start on hold conditioning soon. My question is about heel work. She isn't too bad at it, but no matter what I do, she's always a solid step ahead of me. I pull her back with the chain. I shorten the leash slack. I try walking slower or changing directions. Even after getting her back in position, after three steps, she's ahead again. Feels like I'm constantly correcting and pulling back. I'm good about getting the slack back in the chain, 
but at, then after a few steps, she's ahead again. Any suggestions on how to correct this would be greatly appreciated. I love the content you put out, by the way, DVDs, Bella Be Good, as well as the podcast, just starting in on the workshop videos. So I messaged him back and said, hey, I think we'll do a podcast on this because I had a, virtually the exact same question um, from a gal. I think it was on Instagram. It was about heel work, and it was literally almost the identical message of, you know, every two or three steps, the dog is out in front of me again, and I just feel like I'm constantly correcting and never getting change. And it's just, it's becoming, that's the norm. And so, yes, last week when we had this little puppy, um, the little puppy had a tendency, a little bit different than this, the little puppy wanted to dig its feet in, didn't want to walk with us. So I literally had to bounce it, pop it a little bit with the, with the lead. I'm just using a flat collar with the puppy. I'm not using a slip chain. I'm not using the adjustable leader. Um, the puppy is just too little and doesn't understand necessarily yet the idea of giving in the pressure to the neck. So we just use a flat nylon collar and I just bounced the puppy along a little bit until it moved its feet. And as soon as it moved its feet, there was no pressure. And then I kind of coax it with me a little bit. But I did this in, in within, within two or three turns. So walking in a straight line, then turning 180 degrees and walking in a straight line and turning 180 degrees and walking back, walking back and forth on the exact same straight line. Now, if you're new, uh, even if you're not new to the podcast, a lot of people don't realize that we have training videos. Um, we have them available digitally, and we have them available as a DVD. I spend in the foundation DVD, which is the second one, so we have a puppy one and then we have a foundation one. They're both about three and a half hours long. There's a lot of information there. But in the foundation DVD, I spend probably 25% of that video talking about heel work. I cover a lot of drills that, that I like to do with the dogs. Um, none of them are very complicated. None of them take a lot of space. It's almost all yard work, yard work, driveway work, backyard, wherever. It's, it's not, not out in the field. But when we, we, so we cover a lot of that there in a lot of these drills, but this most basic, simple one, it's something that when we do a workshop, it's the very first thing we do with, in a workshop when we start talking about heel work is 180 degrees because it's dramatically, it can't get any more dramatic the opposite direction. Like it's walking in one direction, it's spinning on a dime and turning and going back the exact same direction you came from and then back and forth. So envision a person walking in a straight line, spinning around, walking the exact straight line back, spinning around, walking the exact same straight. So first off, some people struggle to do that. So there are times at workshops and stuff where we'll just have people do that without the dog because it takes some coordination. It takes some muscle memory, it takes some understanding of how to make that turn efficiently and effectively without a dog, much less with a dog. Because now when you have with the dog, you're starting to correct and do, and, and now it requires timing, it requires good timing. So with this little puppy that I had, I would make turns. And the little puppy, a lot of times I had to slowly make the turn and let the puppy catch up with me because they were wanting to hang back a little bit. Now that's the opposite of what this guy's issue is and it's what the opposite of most people's issues are. The reason it is the issue now is because we're starting at a very young age and the puppy doesn't quite understand the concept yet. That's, in my opinion, the perfect way to do it because it's a lot easier to encourage a dog to catch up with me than it is to slow them down and expect them to get into what I call heel position. Heel is really nothing more than a position. It's not really a, a command, it's, it's, it's a position. It's being in the right spot. And being in the right spot for me, and this is, is, it varies. Some people might prefer their dog to be a step ahead. I think it's a little risky because when they're a step ahead, they're that much closer to taking another step ahead. And by that time, they're disconnected with us. So I want the dog's shoulder. I always heal them on the left-hand side. I want the dog's right shoulder at my left knee. And so the head is just out in front of my knees so that it can see what's going on, but it's not so far in front of me that it's that slippery slope that it just one little step further and it's out and it's disconnected from me. So this is, then that goes back to feel, connection and feel. So eventually my goal is to not use a leash. I want dogs to heal off lead. So it's a, it's a process and incremental steps that we take to get there. But in this situation, this pup, so that puppy wants to hang back. So I'm encouraging it to catch up with me. And then I go to turn. And as soon as it catches up to me and it starts to move in, for, in front of me, I turn and I go the other direction. And very quickly, I've earned the dog's eyes. The, the, the dog is looking at me because he doesn't, he realizes if he loses sight of me, which means he got in front of me, 
I turn and go the other way and I surprise him. If he's not paying attention, he is surprised. He gets a little pop to his neck. And so he starts looking to me to avoid that. And so now all of a sudden he starts to feel me turn and he turns with. And he gets this understanding of no pressure feels good. Where if he's out of position, it doesn't feel good. There's a correction involved with it. There's a little bit of pressure to the neck. So with this situation, I'm going to reread it. So she isn't too bad, but no matter what I do, she's always a step ahead of me. I pull her back with the chain. I shorten the leash slack. I try walking slower, changing directions. Even after getting her back in position, after three steps, she's ahead again. Feels like I'm constantly correcting and pulling back. It's exactly what this gal told me. She was constantly correcting. So she'd correct, 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 then the dog would finally get into position. And so I'm envisioning these people, envision this, they're walking, the dog is out a step, so they, they pull it. The dog comes back, it doesn't even come back, it's just as they're walking forward, they catch up to the dog. So now all of a sudden the dog's in position, so they turn the pressure off. And then as they turn the pressure off, the dog steps out in front again and pulls. So when the dog pulls, they pull it back. So you're turning into this little game of bounce back, bounce back, bounce back, bounce back, bounce back, bounce back, and none of it is changing the behavior because you just said you're constantly correcting. So you're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. What does that feel like to the dog? It feels normal. The dog thinks that heel position, where it should be, is about the spot where you start tugging on its neck. It never changes that behavior because it just becomes numb. That, pre that is not a correction. That's a numb, nagging pull is all that is. And so I say, I always talk about the idea of you have, in order, and when you give a correction to a dog, it should be strong enough that it changes the behavior. It, it, it stops the undesirable behavior. It, it lets them understand what is desirable because what is desirable is zero pressure. And so when you start nagging the dog by constantly correcting, let's just say that's a, a level of a five, okay? It's right in the middle. I always tell people it takes 10 to change behavior. It takes a level of 10 to change behavior. Now, 10 might be a pull this hard today. It might be a pull twice as hard tomorrow. It might be a pull half that the next day. It's still a 10 if it gets a change in behavior. So if you're a five all the time, now it takes 10, it takes, an, it takes a change of 10 to get a behavior change. So stick with me on this. Zero to 10 is an increment, incremental change of 10. That achieves change. If five is nagging constantly, in order to get to a change in the behavior, what do you have to do? You have to get up to a level of 15 it creates a need for even more pressure in order to get the change. So I prefer to start at zero and always go to 10 to get change. Don't go to seven because seven won't get a change. Seven becomes nagging and normal and numb. Eight doesn't get a change. Nine doesn't get a change. 10 does. What is 10? I don't know. You don't know until you try. If you put pressure on the dog and the dog doesn't change, it's not enough pressure. So in this case, there's a couple things. The fix is to continue to change directions. So this guy said, um, I try walking slower or changing directions. Even after getting back in position, after three steps, she's ahead again. So nothing is sinking in with the dog. You're const you said it, you're constantly correcting and pulling back. So what needs to happen is, I love the idea of changing, direct changing speed. That, that happens when the, because that allows me to understand if the dog is truly paying attention or not. If, as I slow down, they slow down. And if they don't, what happens? They get out of position. If they get out of position, that triggers the next response, not a correction, not just a nag and pull them back and then keep moving forward, nag, pull them back, keep moving forward. It changes, it changes the direction 100%. So if, the do, if I slow down and the dog speeds, it continues to maintain the speed and gets out in front, I 180 degrees and I correct firm. I find 10. So 10 gets the dog to recognize, don't do that again. And so they reposition to zero, and I turn pressure off to zero. They reposition, they get in the right spot, and I say zero pressure. And then I start walking forward again for a little while, and as long as they're in position, there's no pressure. But the second they get out in front of me, 
I instantly, 180 degrees, turn around and I correct at a level of 10 again. Now that 10 might be more or less pressure than the last time. It depends on what the response was last time. If the response was not very good, I put more pressure on. If the response was, wow, that was a lot, I might get away with less this time. But I'm not going to make it so light that it doesn't change the behavior. Because if that's the case, all you're doing is increasing the dog's ability to take pressure from you, and it's all it's going to do is require you to put more pressure on to get change. You know, I, I am not going to say I don't put pressure on dogs. I do. I totally do. I think you need pressure, and I think you need praise. I think you need both. I'm not a 100% positive trainer, and I'm not a fear factor trainer. I'm not going to get do avoidance training. So I'm somewhere in the middle which means I have to use a little bit of both. I'm constantly searching to try to get even more in the middle, which means a little bit of each. And so it's less dramatic as things go on and as dogs start to learn behaviors that I'm looking for. But the idea of the problem that I think you're running into here is you're nagging. And so because you're nagging, the dog, the amount of pressure that actually is gonna be required to get a change is gonna be really high for a while. But I think people don't understand. I've got a YouTube, we've got a YouTube video about heel work where we used a buddy of ours. He, he's become a buddy of ours. He started out just coming to a workshop. And Ben and I just talked about it this week because it's on YouTube. And we get a lot of people make comments that are really bad about it. And they're like, I think they're fake people. I don't know. They're trolls or whatever they are. But I, I'm so tired of it, I'm blocking them. I don't even care anymore. It's not worth dealing with people that are just total idiots. But I, that video gets a ton of interaction views. Some are very positive, some are negative. And so, but what happened, what I think people, like this one guy gave a pretty respectful comment about it and said, I just don't think you need to use that kind of pressure. And so I, I and it was a pretty respectful comment. So I went, you know what, what am I doing that's really, a, I gotta watch this video again. It's been a long time since I watched it. So I watched it again because I thought, what did I do to offend this guy? This guy seems pretty reasonable. I watched the video and I made one real firm correction very, very first time. And the dog yipped. And I said it and the owner said it. It didn't hurt him. It startled him. It's, it scared the, pup, the dog. The dog went, Jesus Christ, this is, what the heck? And, he, and from that moment on, I used a fraction of pressure to the point that I didn't even use pressure. I was making turns without pressure and the dog was in beautiful heel position, wagging his tail. And so I looked at that video and I went, Dude, I think people watch the first three minutes of the eight minute video and go, oh my God, this is too much pressure. Watch all eight minutes. Because by the fifth minute, sixth minute, seventh minute, eighth minute, I'm using so little pressure, it's non-existent. And the dog is responding. And the reason is, is because for a day, for a solid day, that dog pulled its owners. And the reason was, is because all they did was constantly nag at them. They just, the dog became numb to the pressure because it was constantly a seven or an eight. And that doesn't change its behavior. So you, I, t I have so many people, especially women will say, I can't pull that hard. You shouldn't have to pull hard. But because you've created this, this, this numbness to that pressure that normally should get the change, you've, you've made it like they're so used to it and calloused that it doesn't even affect them. So yes, you are going to have to make a solid correction to start out with. And then each one from there should become less and less and less until I'm not even putting a leash on the dog anymore. That is the goal. So it's incremental. So with, with Greg here, I want Greg to send me a video uh, of your heel work sessions because you're, I know what's happening. I can tell already. It's the same thing that happened to that girl. It's the same thing. As soon as I put the, that puppy in the hands of its owner, that the first, literally the first walk down, which is, you know, they walk about less than 10, less than 10 yards. It's probably five yards, 15 steps probably. And then we turn and come back and then we turn and come back. We just go back and forth in a straight line for five minutes, three minutes with this little puppy. Cause it's only 12 weeks old, 13 weeks old. But the first three or four steps that he took the puppy from me, I counted one, two, three, four, five. There were five corrections. He put five little tugs on that puppy because the puppy went out in front of him and he tugged it five times, five times, one, two, three, four, five. 
absolutely no change in behavior. And the guy just kept going in the same direction. So I stopped him instantly. I said, now stop. I just counted it out, out loud to make a point. You corrected the dog five times in a row with absolutely no change. And you nothing changed as far as behavior and nothing changed as far as your rhythm and pace. You just kept walking in a straight line. So the dog just went, well, I'll walk along and he'll bounce me. No problem. It wasn't that uncomfortable. And so what I said was, now I want you to, the second the dog gets out of position, the second the dog gets out of position, you turn 180 degrees and you put a correction on that the dog respects and makes change to. So he did. And the dog responded. And then it got good for about three or four steps and then the dog drifted out in front again. So I said, now. So he turned and he corrected and he went the other way. And he got about five or six steps. And then the dog started to drift out in front. So he turned. It was sharp. It was crisp. It took a while before it was very good. His corrections weren't very good to begin with, I'll be honest. But it, because it, he didn't understand the feel of what that should feel like. He didn't understand the, the athleticness, the athletic ability is necessary to literally spin on a dime. I remember at the workshop this, this year, I had a girl in our group that I took her dog and I just held on to the dog and I let her walk squares and I let her walk 180 degree lines and just get her footwork down. Because if you're not used to walking, stopping, turning, walking, stopping, turning, walking, stopping, turning, if you're not used to doing it really smoothly, you get a few extra sloppy steps in there. And those few extra sloppy steps are what doesn't allow the dog to understand what it's supposed to do. You have to be efficient. You can't have wasted steps or you're gonna have a dog that's sloppy because you're sloppy. If you're crisp and efficient, your dog will get crisp and efficient. And then all of a sudden, watch some of these series that I'm doing with some of the pups that I'm training and you'll see when we first start out, they're tripping on their own feet because they're just not used to doing what I'm asking them to do. And then all of a sudden, they're getting their feet in my way, and I don't walk around them. I keep walking. So if their feet get in the way of me, they get stepped on. Well, they very quickly learn, get out of the way. Walk on your own. You know, it's, it's no different than people dancing together. When people have never danced together and don't know how to dance, they're stepping on each other's feet all the time. But that gets uncomfortable, and that doesn't feel good, and it doesn't work very well. So what, do you, what happens as they work together a little bit more and start getting used to each other, start understanding what the other person's gonna do, start getting a feel for each other, start actually having the comfort level with their own muscle memory, they start to move a little bit smoother. And when they start moving smoother, it makes their partner move smoother because they work together all of a sudden. It's very, very similar situation when you're starting to talk about heel work. If you're clumsy, and flopping all over the place and can't walk in a straight line, don't expect your dog to be able to either. So practice being precise. Don't be weaving all over the place. Don't be loose. Don't be sloppy. And, and watch what will happen with when you get crisp, the dog gets crisp. So Greg, that was for you. That was for another, I'll have to find the other message from, and I, I emailed or I messaged the other girl back. I think that one was on Instagram. Um, but this is something that a lot of people will benefit from because a lot of people get 60% good at stuff and just never get past that. So, yeah, the dog's not really dragging you down the road, but he's definitely not in heel position. And you're never going to be able to get him off lead. You're never going to be able to heal a dog off lead that wants to be a step or two in front because the step or two is going to turn into two, three, or four. And when they're three or four, you don't have a chance. They're out they're out of your area. So there you go, guys. We're back on the podcast train. Um, we're in the mid-80s somewhere, aren't we? 85. 85. So the big push to 100 is here, here we go. So Ben and I are going to be cranking out a lot more of these. Um, ben got a new little toy, a new little, what do you call it, a gimbal? Gimbal. He got himself a gimbal. So he's got his own little new little video thing. So if you're listening to this as a podcast, that's great. We appreciate it. We also are, Ben started putting these onto YouTube as video blogs. Um, so you can actually see some of those. Mm -hmm. They're not all going to be there because some of them we didn't record, but some of them we are. And, um, so if you're interested in watching it there, I do recommend our YouTube channel. 
Uh, ben has started to move the Cedar series, which was on Instagram. You started putting it on YouTube yep. and Facebook, or no? Yeah, I share a like a we share a thumbnail a, thing, a link, link to it. Thing. So, so I still think the YouTube channel is big um, as far as value. If you want to go, if you if you would be do us a favor, do Ben a favor. I got a challenge out to Ben to hit a certain number of YouTube subscribers. So if you do us a Ben a favor and hit the sub button while you're there, turn your notifications on, you'll be uh, alarmed or warned when we drop a new one. So, but uh, Bella series continues to go on. I have slacked out on on putting out the promos, and I'm going to get back onto that. But the Bella series continues. Ben is continuing to post those to YouTube. We are through her hold conditioning. We are off and running. The YouTube series will be caught up to that pretty quickly. It's yeah. probably not, but a week or two behind now, huh? Mm. Two weeks? Oof. Three? A little bit. You're, well, still, you're still wearing a sweatshirt. <laughs> well, it's still cold in the YouTube series, but uh, we'll be getting there. Um, so those are good resources. I recommend them. If you do me a favor, if you leave us a rating, um, we appreciate that. It helps us with our understanding of how things are going and understand. And I think it helps with growth organically. So um, for other people to find the podcast. And, and the other thing I'd ask is if you'd share this with someone that you think it would help. Um, so a lot of asks out of that one. I appreciate your support. Um, thanks again, and we will continue cranking these things out.